what for the longest time in this country, uh, black folks, particularly during slavery and coming out of slavery, uh, were characterized as like really incapable and dumb and deviant and on and on and on. You think about all this stuff and like, um, maybe we could take that same theme and, and talk about maybe the history of the, of the black church because that was birthed out of suffering and pain and um, toil, trouble, trial. Friends, welcome to another episode of Culture Conversations. I'm here with my coach, friend, and professor, Brian Key. Yeah, and we're going to get into his life a bit and, and talk about uh, black church, maybe the history of the African-American church, perhaps. A little bit. See how it goes. See how it goes. So, brother, if you don't mind, could you just start by telling us how you came to faith? What was your, your journey of coming to know Christ? Yeah. Um, so I, I grew up in a church in the South. Um, and we were there all the time. I, I I got baptized when I was eight years old. Wow. And I'm pretty sure, like, made a cogent profession of faith then. Um, but fast forward when I got to college, like, had some rebellion and that kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, during the fall of my, uh, my junior year, heard the gospel really, really clearly. Mm -hmm. And God grabbed a hold of my heart. And so there's, there's this aspect of, like, you know, like when you get saved really young or make profession of faith really young. It's like, did I get saved then? Was I saved now? And like, what I've decided, what I've kind of come to terms with is like, Hey, that was a gospel awakening mm -hmm. um, when I was 20 years old. And like the, the full weight and ramifications of the gospel came down. Like after some time of rebellion, I was like riddled with guilt and shame mm -hmm. and all that stuff mm -hmm. like that. And like, man, I got to work my way back into God's favor. And like, that was like a gospel gap for me. Right. Of like, Oh, you don't earn anything. Yeah. And, uh, guy came on campus, did a cross press, cross talk and press gospel presentation. And at the end of it, he goes, um, Hey, uh, I gave you guys a sheet of paper and a uh, pencil on the way in. I want you to write down your sin, the thing you feel shame and guilt about. Um, and if you're willing to give those to Jesus and trust him to pay for those for you, like I've got a hammer and nails here. Uh, and we'll just symbolically nail them to this cross wow. that he had built. And I'm standing there. My Bible study had gotten there early. So we're standing there holding this thing and I'm watching people with wads of paper in their hand, just hammering this stuff. And like the reality of all the stuff that I'm, I feel guilt and shame over and I'm just beating myself over and trying to figure out how to do penance for mm -hmm. essentially mm -hmm. is like, man, Jesus paid all of that. And so he reads, um, Colossians 2, 13, 14. Um, you're dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made you alive together with Christ yeah. and talked about how he having canceled the written code, which stood against you with all of its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Mm. And when he read that, I realized like he literally took all of that and wiped my slate clean and just like felt this rush of freedom mm. over my soul in that moment. So like I got saved when I was little, but like it was really when I was 20, 21, and I was like, oh, I really get the heart of God for me um, through Christ and his work. And when you know that when you know that Christ has paid it all and when you know past, present and future is paid for um, in the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus and, and through faith in him, like you realize that like God is not surprised mm. when, in the future when I sin. Um, and first John one not is true that for those who know him, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to That's forgive right. him cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And so there was this freedom to not feel like I needed to hide from God or perform for God. Um, there was an understanding of God's holiness and understanding of my sinfulness and Christ's great provision in between all of that, mm. that like liberated me um, in a ton of ways and was happier. <laughs> yeah. Right. Happier right. as a man, more free as a man. And I was mm. a young college student and that was like a gift for me to be able to learn how to walk in that freedom. And it was shortly after that I started in the ministry wow. um, because I was just like, man, I, I want other students on our campus and, and other folks to know the great freedom that. What was the ministry that you Jesus. started with? Uh, so my wife and I met um, doing an internship at a church right at, on our college campus, essentially. Mm. Like there was a church um, a couple blocks off of campus across from sorority and fraternity row, basically on our campus at University of Arkansas, okay. a University Baptist Church in Fayetteville and um man like that was where I, I got discipled by by the by the men in that church my wife was discipled by uh the women in our, in our college ministry and like God really blessed us and just transformed our lives through that church and that ministry and so 
we started off as in- interns there, did that for uh, a year and a half or so, and then was full time at that church for a wow. year before we got married and, and ended up moving to Kansas City. So Wow, wow. And then in Kansas City, you're pastoring. Mm-hmm. Uh, what were your other roles there? Yeah, so I, I was there. We were there. Um, we lived in Kansas City for almost 16 years before we moved to Richmond wow. um, to be at Grimke Seminary. And um, for, I mean, I did a number of things. Like I worked as, did inner city ministry at a rescue mission, um, after school program coordinator and chapel. I did chapel for our teens that were coming through the homeless shelter and did all kinds of stuff there. And then I did uh, collegiate ministry at one of our campuses uh, in Kansas City and was uh, serving black students on that campus nice. there. And during that time, we were a part of a core team of a church that planted in 2008. And um, from 2010 until December of 21, like I was serving there on the staff of that church. So wow. it was a lot of fun and done a, done a few different things, small groups pastor and um, preaching pastor and led a pastoral residency program while I was there doing that. So kind of done yeah. A lot some of there. those guys are here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I got some yeah, some, some residents of residents here uh, have come through Grimke Seminary and got a couple who are planning on coming through um, in the next year or so. So I'm I'm excited, man. Like God's been doing some really fun fun work. And so God has given you the gift of many many experiences yeah. and many hats. Mm, yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite? If you just had to pick, like I would rather do this. <laughs> hey, man. Uh, Honestly, I, if if we're just talking just just ministry, um, man, I love preaching God's word. Mm. Um, really, mm. you're a fantastic preacher. Oh, by bro, the way, bless bro. you, man. It's all, yeah. To God be the glory. I I I love preaching God's word, and 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 really, it's not even so much as like just standing up and talking in front of people. Um, I love cooking mm. like a lot, um, and one of my favorite things about cooking is when I like made something that like, hey, this bite's gonna be amazing. Like this taste, this just, I want you to experience this kind of a thing. And I think good preaching is kind of like that. Uh, Psalm mm. 38 or 34 verse eight says, taste and see that the Lord is good, yeah. right? And you you stop and, and when you taste and see that the Lord is good and you've tasted that bite, you're like, hey, I need you guys to enjoy this too. Like I want, can, can, hey, come here, draw close. Mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. trust me, trust me, take a bite. Uh, it will be amazing. And, and I want to serve that to you. Um, I think for me, uh, preaching is a lot like that. Um, you feed, you taste and see that he's good. And all you want to do after that is just give it away. Um, mm. it's fun to do that. Um, and then also while you're doing that, pray that God gives you a feeling sense of what you're preaching so that you're not just talking about truth, but it's like you're actually embodying what it means to worship God and respond to that truth as you preach it. Mm. Um, and I think that invites people to experience and, and taste it themselves. Mm, mm. You were just, we were talking a minute ago before this about uh, you like to make a hook mm-hmm. when you preach yeah. something you keep going back to again mm-hmm. and again. Mm-hmm. I think it's helpful for people to hear. What's your philosophy on that? Well, um, I mean, it's, it's a rhetorical device uh, for, for preaching and, and lots, of, lots of preachers do it. But I grew up in the black church and a lot of uh, my pastors and, and preachers that I heard like would just have this hook that they would come back to. Uh, big idea for the sermon and, and a lot of times would get embodied in the title of a sermon mm. a lot of times but like the idea being that um, like a sermon is about one thing and I want you to take away this one particular thing I'm going to talk about a lot of stuff mm-hmm. but I need it connected to this one thing and and if I can get a rhetorical hook in your mind <laughs> um, then like you'll remember the sermon and probably some stuff that that grew off of that hook um, so Last night I'm preaching and uh, at chapel and preached Acts 12 and it was perilous times call for a powerful church and a powerful church is a praying church. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And like I get up this morning, we come and we're having devotion this morning and like I had a couple of the guys like quote that back to me um, because we had stitched it and it was like, well, that was the thing I wanted you to grab and take away from like, mm-hmm. hey, as we lead our churches as pastors, we want a powerful people who are able to meet the challenges of our day. Well, that means we're going to be praying pastors and praying yeah. church members. And like, if you took that away, that was, that's, that's, what I, that's what I right. wanted. Right. Um, Man, I hope for, for those who watch this and listen, that they could find that sermon yeah. of Peter in prison and the church mm-hmm. praying. I hope, I hope it's available um, for them online mm-hmm. at some point. Yeah, I would love that. Yeah. Man, you talked about a minute ago, like growing up in the black church. Mm-hmm. Um, what was that like? Uh, Tell us your experience in the black church. You said you're from the South, but you yeah. didn't say where. Yeah, I grew up in East Texas. Okay. Yeah, I grew up in East Texas. And um, man, uh, I I love um, 
like not just having a background in the black church, but roots mm. there. And like I grew up out of there, faith grew up out of there. And, and a lot of resiliency and perseverance in the faith um, grew up out of what I witnessed there. Um, I think I heard the word of God preached with precision and passion. And um, when I went off to seminary, like we were learning how to preach it with precision but not with a ton of passion. Mm. And, um, and I saw passion embodied from the pulpit, that feeling sense that I yeah. was talking about. Like yeah. I saw that embodied um, in my pastors and other preachers that I, that I heard growing up. Um, but the thing I talk about the most in my own preaching and, and when I'm talking with other pastors is uh, the songs that we sang and uh, the testimonies that I heard um, along the way shaped my faith in ways that I didn't realize until mm. um, years later. I was actually spending time with uh, a dear friend of mine here in Richmond, um, Grimke graduate, um, African-American guy. He grew up here and I grew up in East Texas, so a thousand miles away from each mm. other or so. And one night we're sitting on my back porch talking and just recounting stories from our church growing up. And I realized that though we grew up a thousand miles away or so, we actually shared the same hymn book in mm. our soul, like not the book of itself, but like, like we're both when things got hard as young adult men, like we ran back to the same kind of songs and and that kind of a thing. And I was like, man, that, there's something there that like this collection of people across a couple of centuries of existence in the black church and across thousands of miles, thousands of miles across this country are holding on to the same songs as a testimony of God's faithfulness. Mm. And and I kind of started looking at it and a lot of the songs we talked about were just walking with God through hardship, how he answered prayers and, and things like that. And I started referring to them as sojourning songs. Like they mm, were songs that like actually taught me how to walk with God. And then I would hear testimonies from people along the way. And the testimonies actually kind of embodied the faith for me mm. in, a, in a lot of ways. Cause like, I wasn't just learning theological truth. Like no one's saying in a testimony, well, you know, God is sovereign and da-da, like that kind of a thing. But like, I learned what it meant when a person believed that God was in control of every aspect of their lives. And they said, man, things got rough here, but I prayed and I trusted God that he would move and that he was in control. And here's how he answered. And mm. I was like, I didn't have the words for it. I was like, we're well, talking about the sovereign God who hears and answers prayer. Yeah. Like, oh, and, 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 and so I began to learn things like that. And so it's kind of like this thing of like, well, you know, Chris shares his testimony with me and I get into a similar situation and I'm like, Hey, God met Chris in a situation mm, like this. Right. Maybe he'll meet me and it like creates uh, plausibility structures mm, mm. in your mind of like, maybe God will meet me like that too. Mm. Hey God, could you meet me like that here too? And sure enough, like he happens to, meet you in that same way and be a rock or a refuge or a provider or whatever it is or healer in those situations and the testimonies actually bore witness to the truth of how, mm. God, who god was so it's like the preaching shaped my soul the song shaped my soul the testimony shaped my song but the prayers of my dad um he's a deacon at my, at my church shaped my soul wow. um my, my mom was my sunday school teacher uh, when i was a little boy and like um to this day like um we talk about uh, just loving God's word. And a lot of that was shaped because she and my dad just in their influence in my early informative years in the church too. Not even realizing it. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, so even, even back to the old spirituals, they were embodying a theology mm -hmm. and it was being taught as song, as lament, but there was a theology mm -hmm. there. It wasn't necessarily a systematic mm -hmm. theology, mm -hmm. like a, like a Grudem or frame. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about that? Yeah. I mean, so I, I <laughs> I did not learn about the sovereignty of God or the providence of God or any of those types of things. I learned about the, the name of it when I got to seminary. Mm. And then you have this thing where like, well, nobody ever told me about this. And I was like, that's not true, bro. That's not true. Like you actually knew about the providential care of God for his people. And you sang about it all mm. the time. So like you think of a hymn like, God me, oh, that great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I'm weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. It's like we are trusting in the provident care of God right. to guide us, to lead us, to provide for us. And I didn't realize that I was getting trained in that 
But like I was getting trained to believe and trust in a doctrine that I would later learn the name mm-hmm. of. Um, and, I, and I think that was actually a, a real witness and, and, a, and a real help to me. Like, I think people should learn proper theological terms and, sure. and all that stuff and be taught, hey, this is what I mean when I talk about the providence of God and all that stuff. But um, part of what happens a lot of time, and it's happened in my own life, is like we'll learn a term but not actually understand what it means. Mm, not us. embody it, maybe. Not embody it and not uh, not digest it and, mm. and, um, and that kind of a thing. And so what you end up with is like you have a theologian waxing eloquently about you know whatever the doctrine is but having never actually embodied a story of that i i went through a season of pretty significant anxiety um uh, almost 10 years ago not sleeping well mm. all that stuff like that i thought i was just i mean i'm 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 pastoring but i'm like racking my brain of like man i have unconfessed sin like is it there's something there and i thought i had issues like justification issues i'm not, not believing the gospel enough mm-hmm, and so i'm mm-hmm. like I read Romans five to eight, like every morning pacing my living room for several months. And I was just like, it, I was hurting, man, like not sleeping past 2 a.m. My wife is like, bro, you're going crazy. I'm like, I know this is wild. And one night um, I had good theology, seminary graduate, pastoring, ordained, like <laughs> you know, all this stuff. All but like I'm sitting in this season and um struggling spiritually and one night i laid down on the floor chris and i was just like i i'm just going to try to pray again like i'm not feeling like prayer prayer is even working at that point Mm, mm. it's how deep this thing was and i laid down on the floor and i said father and it's like the lord stopped me Mm. right there (laughs) and i realized like oh he really loves me Mm. Like to call God father, like he really loves me. He's welcomed me into his family and he really loves me. And I can't do anything to earn that love. And I'll never be able to run outside of that love through Christ. And it was was just like, I got washed with that truth. And what does the first John tell us? Perfect love casts out fear. And like, I began to like feel this freedom that I had not felt like ever to some degree Mm. But especially in that season, and I realized then I was trying to address justification issues like, nope, I got to believe the gospel. I'm I'm forgiven already. And what I actually needed to receive was the truth of adoption. Wow. And it it, it wrecked me. (laughs) And I I laugh now because it's funny, but like, you know, G.I. Packer, I I believe just like love God. (laughs) Like, I love reading the works of theologians that like love God and seem to know him. Mm -hmm. J.I. Packer's Knowing God, he talks about adoption as one of the highest privileges of the gospel. And me and my young, restless, reformed mind was just like, no, like, I I mean, like, it's it's justification because da, 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 da. But like, at that moment, laying on the floor in my living room, I understood, hey, man, like, it is a great privilege to be called son Mm -hmm. of the most high Mm -hmm. God and to be able to not just come to him as like distant, far off God, but say, hey, father. I need some help. Yeah. And to know without a shadow of a doubt, he loves you and there's nothing that you can do to ever make him love you more and nothing you could ever do to make him love you yeah. less. It's a liberating thing. Mm. And so like that, I got, <laughs> was able to get kind of put flesh on some theological stuff. It's right almost there. like uh, adoption is relational. Mm-hmm. Justification is like judicial. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's right? right. And you didn't need judge language and mm-hmm. legal language. You needed relational mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. language and truth mm-hmm. and reality mm-hmm. and it's like both are true but like there's there's things like you have to turn the prism of, of gospel truth mm. in different seasons and receive different things from from what god has done for us in christ and that was a season where it's like hey turn that around a little bit adoption is very important yeah and it not as a doctrine again but as an experience a reality yeah a reality yeah, yeah. yeah. How, did, how did it change so you're on the floor father you're stopped in your tracks this revelation comes mm. like did you become less anxious yeah like mm. i mean like it was it was one of those things and i think it was just one of those miraculous moments i don't want to make light of anxiety at all um like take medicine do what you need to do yeah. Yeah. but like in that moment in that particular season it was a, it was a it was a deep spiritual struggle for me 
that like God actually unlocked and like I became um, more free as a man, like something like fundamentally, I believe changed in me wow. in that season. And to the point where my wife would start saying, Hey, something different about you. Wow. Members of our church would be like, Hey, something's different about your preaching now. And, um, I realized that there was something that God needed to work down in me, um, that I knew I preached about adoption sure. since, Romans 8, what are we talking about? <laughs> you know, like, right. um, but I, there was something that God needed to work down in me um, in terms of realities and experience with him and, and with the gospel that like, I think fundamentally just changed me. Like I, I was more free, more joyful, less anxious, um, less feeling the need to like perform mm. and like mm. be on top of everything. Cause it was like one of the lies that I believed um, over the course of my life is my performance makes me lovable. Mm. Um, that probably wasn't conscious, right? No. Yeah. No, it, it wasn't conscious until like I came to terms with it, and I was like, "Oh, that's a problem, and that's anti-gospel." Mm. Mm. Um, because if my performance makes me lovable, then my failure therefore makes me unlovable. Well, that that's like either you're on the highest of highs, mm. or you're in the depths and feeling despair, right? And it all depends on how you're doing. Exactly. It's all on you. Not about what Christ has declared is true about me um, and not about what I'm experiencing with God through Christ in any moment. Mm. So it sounds like you, you had this revelation and deeper walk with God burst out of suffering mm. and, and a trial, like mm. a real trial. Mm. Yeah. 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 And, that, and, that, and I was like, what's funny is like, that was like the second wave of trial, at least um, over the course of that time. And like God teaches really significant things to us in trials. I think James one and, and Romans five bear that out for us. But um, you know, God used that season of trial to like, hey, I'm gonna teach you one more thing mm. about me. Um, and if, we, if we're paying attention during seasons of trial and seasons of suffering um, and pressing into God, then like I think there's, there's a lot of gold to be mined um, mm. during mm. those seasons. So, Man, you had mentioned in a sermon a couple intensives ago about your daughter. I don't know mm -hmm. if you're comfortable sharing yeah. that, but I think that's really, that would be really helpful for yeah. people to hear. Yeah, man. Um, so we had, we've had three daughters. Um, my wife and I have been married 16 and a half years. Um, and um, we've had three daughters. Our oldest would be this year. What is this? It's 2023. She'd be 14 this year. Mm -hmm. uh, she was still alive, but uh, she passed away when she was three. Um, and over the course of that three years, we were in and out of the hospital just pretty constantly after she was three months old, like um, like a significant epileptic disorder, uh, infantile spasms. Um, she had heart defects and um, lung issues. We had respiratory illnesses that put her in the hospital like almost every month, kind of. Mm -hmm. it, was, it, was, it was like touch and go and never ate by mouth. So she had a, a ton of complications that we really didn't understand the origin of them, um, mm -hmm. honestly. Um, and during that season of walking with her, um, <laughs> I, I was in seminary at the time. You got really good theology, but like you kind of you kind of realize that like, um, how do I talk about the sovereignty of God in a way that's like not distant and far off in the middle of this? Yeah. And um, during that season, she was. I remember she was four days old and I remember writing my journal. We had sang great is our faithfulness at church and, uh, that Sunday and I'm 26 or so at the time. And I was like, hey, where's that passage? And I flip over to Lamentations three and read like my soul's bereft of peace. And I've forgotten what happiness is. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds, that sounds about right right now, you know? Mm -hmm. And this right. is, this is very early in her, in our, like she's four days old right. at this point. We had no idea what was ahead of us. And, um, and then you get to the turn in Lamentations 3, but this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to mm -hmm. an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, yeah. O Lord. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. And I began to realize that like I can, I can lament, but great is our faithfulness was like just kind of the tag throughout our life. And so we began even like, if he has new morning mercies every day, then like, with eyes of faith, you look for the new morning mercy, mm -hmm. uh, even in the middle of a trial. So 
that was like kind of the arc. I actually sang her to sleep, singing wow. Greater Thy Faithfulness wow. almost every night of her life. Mm. Um, and then during that season, I started reading the Psalms um, regularly. And as I'm reading the Psalms, that word steadfast love of the Lord in Lamentations 3, steadfast love gets repeated over mm -hmm. and over throughout the Psalms. And I began to be like, there's something to this. Like, and started kind of just marking how many times the psalmist referred to the, the steadfast love of the Lord, his covenant faithfulness to his people. And um, and I realized like, this is an important truth about God. And then started reading through them again and realizing said the Lord is, or God is a number of times. And well, God is fortress and God is rock. Mm. And um, God is refuge and strength, very present help in times of trouble, mm -hmm. and like all this stuff. And it dawns on me, like things begin to click in a place of like, well, if God never changes, his word says he's a refuge. I can ask him to be a refuge today. Mm -hmm. if he says he's a shepherd. I can ask him to be a shepherd today. Yeah. Um, that kind of a thing. And so that kind of developed in me, um, I forget what theologian talks about it, um, like knowing God, not distant, but through personal pronouns. Mm. Um, I didn't know that quote at the time. And I just being crude and preacher, um, I was just like, I just talk about it as the my ness of God, like to my be, shepherd. Yeah. My yeah, God. Yeah. My fortress, yeah. It's my like rock. not just a shepherd, but like mine. Mm. And when you begin to walk through things, and realize that it's not just God is some distant far off, but like he's present and imminent with me in the middle of this. He's mine. That changes the way you walk sure through things. And God, God trained us in that, in that season to trust him. Um, Job 42, five, I'd heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. It's Job's testimony. Like, Hey, I, I thought I knew you, but like mm -hmm. now in this season of suffering, and as you've spoken to me about your greatness, now I see what who you are and, and what you're about. And like God did that in that season. Yeah. Uh, and we lost Olivia. Um, she was three years old when she passed away, like I said. And um, and even in the middle of that, like, great is our faithfulness, is mm. our testimony. Like, that's etched on our tombstone. Wow. Like, anybody that ever sees Olivia Grace's tombstone, like, sees great is our faithfulness, mm. Lord, unto me. And we sang that at her, at her funeral. Wow. Um, because that was a story of a God who carried us and was with us in the middle of it. And like, so you get these places of deep suffering, yeah. um, but there's a prayer at the beginning of, um, the Valley of Vision, the first page of it talks about the Valley of Vision. It's like, man, from the deepest valleys, you see the brightest stars and, mm. and like, that's what God did in that season. We saw him for who he truly is and experienced him in different ways. And, um, that shaped my ministry and shaped, oh, yeah. shaped our life and. Um, God's not just an idea to talk about. He's a, he's a person to behold and love and be loved by. Mm, mm. Man, that's got to be so hopeful for people who are really going through it, yeah. to hear your story and to see how you've come through it and have known God deeper mm. through those experiences. Well, um, maybe we could take that same theme mm. and, and talk about maybe the history of the, of the black church because mm. that was birthed out of suffering mm. and pain mm. and um, toil, trouble, mm. trial. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of deep theology came out of that suffering mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, do you want to speak to that before we get into specifics? Yeah, I mean, like, I, I think um, a, a lot of the black church history, as I've, as I've read, like, you've got the first black churches, um, like, happening uh, on plantations and things like that. But, like, the late 1700s, and early 1700s, you got um, churches being birthed in black communities. Um, and, and for me, for me, like when I look at the history of the black church and, um, and consider like the historical realities and difficulties and, and things that have been awful in our own country, I tell people regularly, like, Hey, the black church is a miracle. Mm, mm. Here's why I say that for a group of people to look at Christianity and to look at Jesus who people who are oppressing them say is Lord of all the earth and say, no, he actually is Lord of all the earth, but actually, but hold it not in a way that like dehumanizes themselves and says, and I, therefore I deserve this. They're, they're, they're who are able to say, yes, Christianity is right. Jesus is real and he is real good. 
And this is abhorrent and wrong. Like you think about the witness of, of someone like Frederick Douglass, like and he, he just was straight up like, hey, man, like the Christianity, as I understand from the Bible, is not the Christianity of this land. Sure. <laughs> kind of like he's able to like these are two different things kind mm -hmm. of a thing. And, and, I, and I think like that witness of being able to in the middle of oppression, in the middle of hardship, to be able to see Jesus as Lord and push away all the other junk that was being done in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's a powerful witness to me of the power of God, the sustaining power of God and the um, powerful activity of the spirit to overcome any kind of cultural hurdle we've tried to put in front of his work mm. um, through action or inaction. Um, like, I, I think it's just a powerful testimony. And so for me, when I think of the black church, um, I think of people who learned how to sojourn through suffering and who experienced real persecution mm -hmm. on these shores, um, but stayed with God and trusted God and endured with God through it. And so now um, we taught, taught a class on black church history a couple um, semesters ago. And like, it was had my students write like, Hey, what's the gift of the black church to the American church and to the Western church? And I think the gift is we've persevered through some really hard cultural times and, and cultural winds blowing every which direction. But like the testimony is like the gospel is real and Jesus is real and we will not turn our backs on him because he has not turned his back on us. Mm. And so like in the, <laughs> in the middle of chaos and people deciding like, well, because this cultural element has gone, ar gone awry, therefore Jesus must not be true. Like, I tell people all the time, I was like, hey man, like my people have not, That's right. it's not the first this, this is not the first time. And people said, nope, Jesus is still true. Those people are crazy. And Jesus is still true. <laughs> you know? So um, I, I love that as a, like when I think about the history and just look back on it in broad perspective. Mm, I took that class with you. I really mm. appreciated it. Um, one of the books we read was called The House of Bondage, which mm. really gave me a perspective I had never considered before from the perspective of slaves mm. in their own words. Mm. Uh, I recommend anyone pick that mm. up. But yeah, the gathering in the plantations, in the slave mm. quarters, mm. having secret church, mm. having to be quiet, mm. master comes out, they gotta shut it down. Mm. Like, that's some serious mm. dedication and like it is a miracle, mm. you know? Yeah. It really is. Yeah, it is. And like <laughs> another thing for your hearers from a historical standpoint, like there's people who look at that and say, well, black people weren't Christians until slavery. Mm. It's like, well, that, yeah, well, yeah, it's just like, but that's the thing is like Christianity was something forced on black people in, in slavery. And like you take Acts 8 and the larger his church history, right. <laughs> and you're like, no, there, there was a vibrant Ethiopian church, like in the early centuries yeah. um, after the turn of the millennia. And, and you got the church fathers, the Augustans, Athanasius, Tertullians, those yeah. like African church fathers, like the gospel and the, the doctrines, historic doctrines of the Christian church being defended um, by African scholars and theologians. And so like, you know, for, for me, it's not just the history of the black church, but you look back and say, man, God has been work among peoples of African descent since the beginning That's of right. the church. Yeah, Old Testament. Uh, it's like, this is a it's, it's it's an amazing testimony, and I think gives us gives us like it's a it's for an apologetic argument. It helps us to like to stop ridiculous arguments, but also just like when you think about the broad testimony of of the gospel and the truth that it's for all nations and all peoples. Like, I mean, God is being good on His word. Like, That's right. like all peoples are participating That's right. um, in his redemptive activity. And I, I, I thank God for that. Yeah. Simon of Cyrene and his son. That's right. I mean, yeah, right. you just, you, if you just read the New Testament with an eye to ethnicity, mm. it's, it's unmistakable. Mm. Uh, before the Reformation. Yeah. Far before the Reformation. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, man, that's good. Um, yeah, I want to I wanna get your opinion on something. So our, our church has two black elders, two mm -hmm. white elders, mm -hmm. and we have these kind of discussions all the time, which mm -hmm. are really helpful mm -hmm. for me. One of the things Justin, one of our elders said one time, he was trying to help me understand, uh, you know, you have, I'll give you the story. In, in one of our malls, um, there was a table put out and, and there were signs everywhere and it said, it said black excellence. Mm -hmm. And there was all kind of black people gathered around and they were, you know, signing up papers, whatever it was for, mm -hmm. it was something. 
And I was trying to explain uh, in a podcast actually to Justin, like I could just see people looking and being like, man, if if that was flipped around Mm -hmm. and that said white excellence, Mm -hmm. you know, and Justin had something so profound and helpful to say. He said, look, you got to understand black kind of functions as an ethnicity Mm -hmm. uh, because you don't know technically which country in Africa, Mm -hmm. you know, the the black people who were brought here came from. Mm -hmm. It functions as its own ethnicity. Could you speak to that? Because I think most people miss that, Mm -hmm. especially white people. Yeah, I mean, like you've got... um us that that does that does work as almost like an ethnic bucket in it because we don't know like i don't know where i am past i think like three generations back mm. because um it was my great great grandfather was an enslaved man and i don't know where beyond that anything mm-hmm. and so like <laughs> you look at that like we're, it's kind of the catch-all the ethnic catch-all and and whereas like um, European, <laughs> American, you know, we say African American or just white, or just white people. It's like, but you're European Americans. There is a cultural, that's right, like distinct cultural ties that that people have that can trace all the way back. But they melded all that together to form white, which isn't an ethnicity so much as like a, a um, like a culture <laughs> and a way of living and a way of being here. Um, in the States. When I think of black excellence though, um, my parents were, uh, grew up during the age of schools being integrated mm. and were big on education with us, big on education. Like, hey, we will succeed and we will perform. But like, when you think of it, man, like for a long time, we did not have opportunities to excel that's right. In all in all kinds of pathways that we do now. I'm not saying things are perfect now, but like we have opportunities more abundant than when my parents were children. Mm-hmm. Uh, so like from that standpoint, they pushed us to be great, to be smart, to uh, be thoughtful, to be wise, to like all those things. And like that when I grew up, that was black excellence for us. Like we will be a successful people, uh, a proud people, um, a capable people. Mm. Uh, who work hard and are honorable people like so like maybe take offense you people could take offense at black excellence all they want to but like we are saying we're going to get the best out of ourselves yeah. we're going to help people understand that that is countering something mm-hmm. right that's countering yeah. a cultural narrative that is the opposite. It's, yeah it's countering a cultural narrative particularly from the outside um, <laughs> particularly from the outside of our of our culture of um what for the longest time in this country uh black folks particularly during slavery and coming out of slavery uh, were characterized as like really incapable and dumb and deviant Mm -hmm. and on and on and on. You think about all this stuff and like um, specific things were said and done that demeaned what you and I know is true because of the Imago Dei, Mm -hmm. because all human beings bear the image of God. We know that there's inherent dignity and worth and value even if they can't perform anything. So like mm-hmm. my daughter who has special needs and never learned how to talk, walk, eat, she's created the image of That's God. Right. And like you, and you're like, she has inherent dignity or worth. Absolutely. She does, <laughs> you know? And, and you look around to all people's having inherent dignity and worth about them. And when you demean people for so long, things get plugged into mm-hmm. their, into mm-hmm. their minds that say, well, maybe I'm not anything. And people who are saying, no, 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 we actually are. And we can be better than anyone says mm-hmm. we can be like as a call up and a grabbing of that Imago Dei truth. Even if people aren't believers, like they're grabbing something that is generally like just known to be true, that humans have value, mm-hmm. that human beings have value, even if no one's ever read Genesis 1, 27, 28. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. It's like so. Um, so in that in that sense, like it's countering those lies culturally um that have been told and that you start kind of believing i was going to ask that don't you think that a lot of those lies get told so much and so often it's even believed by those Mm -hmm. who are being lied yeah i mean like my the kids i worked with um at that rescue mission i worked at like um i did an exercise one time just trying to see what they see what they were like and i put a graph on the board and i put you know white black hispanic asian and just said hey talk to me about stereotypes 
about all these people, just trying to get them to start talking about what they believed about different people, and what they believed about themselves. And what was sad, Chris, is like the number of things they, demeaning things they put in their own category, mm. in, the, in, in the black category. And I was like, hey, stop, man. <laughs> you will like, look at this. When you looked at um, white culture, you said successful, Hispanic culture, you said hardworking, Asian culture, you said intelligent, et cetera, and, and kind of had these glowing adjectives to describe these other cultures. And their own self-perception was a demeaning self-perception. Mm. And I was like, hey, man, like, here's what God says about you. Mm. And I don't care what anybody says about you. And I actually don't care if you ever succeed at anything of earthly value. Here's what God says That's about right. you. And here's what's actually true about you. And I need you to actually start, not in a weird affirmation kind of way, but like, I actually need you to start telling yourself the truth about what God says right. about you. Because like, at the end of the day, he's got the last word That's on right. you. And if he says valuable, inherent dignity and worth, then like, you should believe that about That's yourself. Right. Um, you should believe that about yourself. And like, um, it, it was sad for me, but also just like a real gift to say, I have an opportunity to reshape and rewire and understand mm, self-understanding mm. with these kids. And it was a really beautiful opportunity, which like all we're ever doing in, in some ways as Christians and as pastors and all that stuff like that is saying, Hey, here's what God has said about mm. you and reorienting people's self-perception yeah. um, about themselves and about the world and all that stuff like that. So that was like one particular way we were able to do it with, with our, with those kids and, and with our own kids and, and kids that they're around as well. Mm -hmm. Um, to be able to call them up towards excellence, not because they're better than anybody or anything like that, but just like, hey, we're going to get the best out of our God-given talent and all that he's invested in us. And and we want to be excellent about how we yeah. go and do it. Like, that's good. Yeah, that is you good. You should do that. <laughs> yeah. And you're doing that now uh, here at Grimke even. You know, you're, mm -hmm. you're a professor. You're teaching good church history, countering lies, doing, you know, cultural apologetics, mm -hmm. teaching truth. Um, so it's kind of like an extension of that, mm -hmm. wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> like right now, as I teach in our urban ministry program, um, we're training pastors to go and do that same work. Um, I, I've kind of just encapsulated what I feel like is in part my calling in life besides preaching and pastoral ministry and stuff like that. But like, I want to see whole men take the whole gospel into broken places and see those places transformed and brought to wholeness through Jesus. Mm. And what I mean is like, I, I want men who have cultural competency, theological competency, uh, emotional competency and intelligence, mm. and are whole men themselves, who are able to go into places with broken theology and broken culture and broken emotional and psychological world and bring the whole gospel to that, every bit of the healing of Jesus being proclaimed in that place um, and seeing people transformed, neighborhoods transformed. Yeah. And like, man, I, I want to do that and, and call it's and, and all we're doing, man, think about this. Like all we're doing as we preach the gospel is calling people into what God intended for us from the beginning. Mm, that's good. To know him, to walk with him and to be, to bear his image mm. and, and what's happening with us in Christ. We now know God, we can now walk with God and we are being conformed more and more into his image degree by degree. Like, yeah. That's all we're doing is like, I'm calling forth the best that God has created you for um, as I preach the gospel and we do that in every aspect of our lives. Mm. Man, that's good. Appreciate that. Yeah. And uh, I just want to say on film, man, you grading one of my papers really helped me through a coaching session to understand how to write better, mm. how to think critically through, through books and be positive criticism. Mm. In fact, I remember you said you should never agree with anything an author says or everything an yeah. author says in a book you should yeah. have some some critique of yeah. that was really helpful yeah so man you've helped me a lot and i, I appreciate you, that Seriously. appreciate you man so thank you man thanks for doing this yeah, i know for sure. you know time flies by you got a class you gotta go go attend to so yeah. brother thank you thank you man appreciate it. For you. hopefully we can do this again soon. likewise man, love it all right peace